Good evening. Thank you for coming and braving the cold, windy streets. Uh, my name is Peter Christian Eigner. I'm the deputy director here at the Gotham Center. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for agreeing to participate in this panel. Um, uh, the spring calendar of events will be posted, live, uh, posted on the website in a few weeks. So if you have not signed up for the mail list already, uh, the sign-up sheets are outside. Um, so I was brainstorming the calendar for uh, the fall winter season and thinking for looking for new or recent scholarship uh, that would be connected to the most areas of debates in the city that would that were respected significant action or impact. Um, so we settled on the events that we did this semester, affordable housing and homelessness, desegregating public schools, student debt, and the defunding of higher ed. Uh, and then in August, Mike Wallace, our chairman, our distinguished chairman, uh, suggested that we add a panel on New York as a sanctuary city, broadly defined, um, after reading uh, a piece by Francisco Goldman in The New Yorker about the campaign. I think he says something like, this might be very, very relevant if Donald Trump becomes president, God forbid. Um, so I confess I was a little dubious. I didn't think that he would win or that Congress would shift to a coalition that would support comprehensive immigration reform, what Hillary was running on. Um, so I'm in the unfortunate position of saying that we planned well. Um, it's hard to think of any policy field we've discussed this season not being dramatically affected by the next two to four years. Um, but this is one that seems most relevant, perhaps, at least potentially, in terms of scale and direct human impact. Uh, Trump quickly backpedaled on his signature promises during the campaign, like the wall and the 11 million deportation figure, I expect. We'll hear tonight about the many hurdles anti-immigration forces uh, still face legally and politically in the country. A little so, so looking for the silver lining. Um, but the incoming government appears committed to policies of malign neglect at best. And it's hard not to see all the images coming out of Aleppo over the past few days and not think about the influence presidents have in setting the refugee bar. Um, the U.S. set a record last year, actually, in admitting Muslim immigrants, taking in 12,500 Syrians, roughly. Um, but there have been 11 million forced to leave since the Civil War began. And the um, president-elect not only has uh, financial assets, apparently, with uh, crucial financial assets with uh, Assad's main ally, but apparently owns his, owes his new job to him. Um, the relevance of this subject for New York City uh, is pretty obvious. Uh, we haven't always been a sanctuary for refugees and migrants, the Dutch, despite their, represent their uh, popular representation these days sometimes, um, nearly destroyed uh, the colony, fledgling colony of New Netherland by massacring a group of refugees that had negotiated asylum, uh, triggering Keith's War. The anti-Catholic know-nothings had their headquarters here in the city. Um, and the leading birther and a proponent of a closed or white border is one of our own, a son of Queens, um, the most diverse real estate on the planet. Um, nonetheless, we have been the capital of immigrant America for centuries. It was a governor of New York who nearly split the Democratic Party in two during the 20s over the question of immigration. Um, it, it's New York that was the city to which hundreds of Jewish immigrants, uh, refugees rather, set sail in 1942. Uh, and though they did not expect or intend the kind of diversity that has followed since the immigration reform in 1965, the liberals who opened up the country's borders again gathered when they gathered to sign the bill outside of the Statue of Liberty, logically enough. Um, we have a universally familiar history of ethnic and religious conflict and exploitation, but it is not without reason that one can refer to New York values and know that many will instantly read the phrase as meaning tolerance, diversity, and support to outsiders in need. Uh, so with that much being said, I want to quickly introduce the panelists we've been lucky enough to gather here on stage and then get off stage so we can listen to what they have to say. Um, first, May Nye. Uh, our distinguished expert on the legal and political history of immigration, uh, professor of history and Asian American studies at Columbia University, and the author of Impossible Subjects, 
Illegal Aliens and the Making of Modern America, which won six professional book awards and uh, reframed the historiography on immigration, citizenship, and nationalism in 20th century America. She publishes widely on the subject, and we are grateful to have her. Nisha Agarwal, um, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, is like May, uh, the daughter of immigrants. Um, after finishing her JD at Harvard Law School, she collaborated with Robert Katzman, the Chief Judge at the Second Circuit, to establish a nonprofit recruiting fresh law school graduates and partners to offer free representation, legal representation to immigrants. She also helped co-found the Center for Popular Democracy, an immigrant advocacy group, and directed the health justice program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. In recent years, New York's Office of Immigrant Affairs has been described as a model for cities around the world trying to better serve their immigrant populations. And under Commissioner Agarwal's leadership, it has developed a number of programs worthy of mention designed to solve the most urgent needs, including municipal ID card, Action New York, which offers free legal aid, and the offshoot affordable health care plan for low-income in migrants who do not meet uh, the qualifications for insurance under the private or public systems. So I'm eager to hear her thoughts. I'm very glad that she could join us. Uh, Camille Mackler, director, director of Legal Initiatives at the New York Immigration Coalition, an umbrella group representing nearly 200 advocacy groups in New York City. Um, in that capacity, works alongside local stakeholders on issues related to immigration law in the state. Before joining, she represented immigrants before the U.S. immigration courts and federal courts of appeals. Uh, and is focused primarily on, in her work, on asylum and refugees, uh, asylees and refugees, pardon, um, de de deportation pre uh, proceedings, immigration detention, and family-based immigration issues. I thank her for joining us. Heather Axford, a senior staff attorney at Central American Legal Assistance, a nonprofit organization that has been serving asylum seekers since 1986. She has primarily represented trauma survivors facing deportation and victims of constitutional violations by immigration and customs enforcement, as well as indigent immigrants eligible for other humanitarian immigration relief. She practices regularly before the Immigration Court, the Board of Appeals in the Second Circuit, and is a graduate of UVA Law School. Finally, last but not, certainly not least, Julia Preston, who was until the first of this month uh, a national correspondent on the immigration beat for the New York Times. Um, territory she covered with distinction for 10 years. Before that, she reported on news in the federal courts, served as a foreign correspondent to Mexico for 11 years, and came to the Times as a former bureau chief for the Washington Post. I'm happy to add as well that she's going to continue in her new independent career to report on these issues so that we can stay abreast of what is happening. So with that, I'd ask you to please join me in welcoming our guests. All right, well, we're gonna start with uh, Professor Nye. May, you have been asked to summarize, as only a historian could do, an entire century of the evolution of American immigration law in 10 minutes. <laughs> so let me start you off with a question that may help to focus your comments. Has New York, in fact, been a sanctuary city for immigrants? Is it just an entry point? In the framework of the law, has New York been different than, Uni than the United States as a whole? Uh, I think New York has been and is a sanctuary city, but I'm gonna leave it to my colleague from the mayor's office to give a more precise uh, explanation for that. But I think it, it has been and it continues to be. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on what sanctuary has meant in this country um, and then from there, back up a little bit in terms of um, the whole problem of undocumented immigration and deportation. So sanctuary, I think we can say broadly defined, is a declaration by an institution, like a church, uh, or a political jurisdiction, like a city, um, that they are a haven for people seeking refuge or asylum uh, from prosecution by the state. Right? So even if you go back to the late medieval era, there were churches who gave sanctuary to people who were alleged criminals, and they were held them for up to 40 days to negotiate with state authorities in terms of what would be the terms of their um, uh, um, 
arrest and prosecution. Um, but so there is an assumption that the people to whom you are offering sanctuary have been accused of some kind of crime or some kind of um, unlawful uh, action or deed or in the case of undocumented immigrants, unauthorized presence. Um, so all acts of sanctuary involve a, a kind of civil disobedience and I think that's really important as a general framework for us to understand. Now there are a lot of interesting workarounds, legal workarounds um, that so that there are ways to provide sanctuary that is not in fact unlawful, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but I think it's important to understand that what sanctuary really means is a kind of defiance of the state to protect people who are being pursued by the state. So if we step back a little bit from there, we might ask the question, why, are, why do so many people or just we'll say, why do so many New Yorkers believe that undocumented undocu immigrants are deserving of sanctuary? After all, they are, by definition, here without authorization. And I think most, most New Yorkers would say, we, have, we feel that there's some kind of moral obligation we have to protecting people who are our neighbors, our coworkers, our students, um, from unjust laws, right? Especially when it involves the separation of families. Um, so that brings us to the next question brings us back one more step. Uh, what is unjust about our immigration laws that create undocumented or illegal immigrate, immigrants, right? Why do we think our immigration laws are, are unjust? Um, that they would command us to take a moral position that we say is above the law. Um, so here's my mini mini lecture. So I, what I want to tell you to help us understand this, that immigration law in this country is based on a key doctrine which is called the plenary power, right? And in this instance, plenary means absolute. It means that the Congress has absolute authority over the making of immigration laws. Um, and immigration law, the, the regulation of immigration is put in the same basket with Congress's conduct of foreign relations. So it's in the same basket of powers that Congress has to declare war on foreign countries, to uh, ratify treaties with foreign countries, and, uh, and the general conduct of foreign relations. So in this sense, the, the, many of us would think it's kind of outrageous to conflate immigrants with foreign powers, right, especially with a pot as a, a potential enemies, but that is actually the grounding in uh, the jurisprudence of immigration, and it's been that way since the late 19th century, and it was something that was used to justify the Chinese exclusion laws. Now, um, so the plenary power, under the plenary power, our immigration doctrine says that uh, nobody, no alien, right, no foreigner, has a right to enter the country, um, nor has a right to remain. Right, there is no starting right, right? So now a lot of people might say, well, okay, any random foreigner out there in the world doesn't have a right to enter just because they're out there, right? Now some people might argue with that, <clears throat> that we don't believe in any borders. But, but and that, that's, that's a position I respect. Um, but I think most people would say states have, have some right to determine who is going to enter, how many and under what conditions. Now, asylum is a kind of exception to that, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But in general, our, our law proceeds from the basic principle that no foreigner outside the country has a prima facie right to enter, right? Now, the right to remain is a little more complicated, right? The right, the right to remain um, does not flow from, I mean, it flows from a different understanding, right? So it's more complicated because once somebody is in this country, regardless of their legal status, they become part of our communities, they become part of our society, they contribute to the economy through their work, um, they acquire property, they have families. Um, so this is where, in my work, I, I think about this problem of what I call the impossible subject, right? Somebody whose social inclusion in our, in our community is a fact, is a social fact, and yet their legal, their ability to be here is a legal impossibility. So there are only way, two ways to resolve this problem of the impossible subject. One is to legalize the person, is to recognize their inclusion, right, their, their de facto inclusion, to recognize that with um, legal status, or to remove, the, remove them. And 
anything other than those two options means that people live in shadows, as, as we say, they live in fear, um, and they live with diminished rights. Now, the thing I want to say about this, um, this idea that aliens don't have the right to enter or the right to remain is that it doesn't mean they have no rights when they are here, right? One of the wonderful things about the 14th Amendment is that it applies to all persons, right? The rights of due process and equal protection apply to all persons, all, all persons who are territorially present. It does not limit it, it's not limited to citizens. So in matters, say, of, of criminal actions or anything under the, the, the Bill of Rights, um, foreigners, including undocumented, have the same rights as citizens, right? So there's a tension between this, what, this immigration law, right, this immigration doctrine, and the doctrine of the 14th Amendment. So the judges think they're separate, but if you think about it, um, do you really have the right to free speech if the government doesn't like what you say and they can deport you? Right, so this, this is where we get into trouble with trying to separate these two dom domains of law. So, um, so one of the things this leads to is um, a, a, a wide degree of uh, discretion on the part of um, immigration authorities as to how to, inf how to enforce the laws, right? Um, and uh, when it comes to deportation, we have a, a very long history of discrimination in terms of who even gets, who even becomes uh, considered to be unlawfully present. That's the first question. Uh, and the second question is then who, what, who, what communities are singled out or are targets for removal. So on the first point, I think um, what I want to just say is that the, the 1965 immigration law, which was a, which considered a general reform of uh, a discriminatory system, right, that favored people from Northern Europe against Eastern and Southern Europe and excluded all Asians, right, that law was reformed, but that law had a lot of illiberal effects, right, and one of, one of those was, was to subject all countries in the world to the same maximum number of new visas green cards. So this was done, this is very much a civil rights era uh, legislation. It was seen as treating all countries equally, the way we treat all persons equally. But if you think about it, why should New Zealand have the same number of the same maximum as Mexico, right? That's the system we have, right? No country can have more than 7% of the total number of green cards issued a year, new green cards issued a year. So. There are only four countries that max out on their quota. The quota is like 26,000. It's ridiculously low, right? The only four countries that max out year in and year out are Mexico. You can name them yourselves, I'm sure. Mexico, India, China, and the Philippines, right? We we're just talking about a woman who's waited 19 years for a, a visa um, as, as an adult child of a, a of a citizen, citizen, of a US citizen, a woman from Mexico, and her father passed away. So she waited 19 years, and now the person is not even there um, to, to be her uh, family connection. Um, there are some categories where the wait is, you know, uh, 25 to four, even 40 years. So when people say, get to the back of the line, it's really a cruel joke if you're from one of these countries that has a huge visa backlog. Um, second, there are also other ways where um, some countries, uh, who may have um, not fulfilled their quotas, but there are other ways that bar people from coming, uh, notably the income requirement, right? We still have a very old fashioned um, category called likely to become a public charge, right? We don't admit aliens who are likely to be public charges. And that means that the family sponsor has to earn a certain amount to guarantee that their, the immigrant will not um, go to welfare. Um, so not all people have families with income that can meet that. So many of them come without authorization. Um, and then we also have issues of people who come seeking asylum, who come from really bona fide um, reasons from uh, countries where there are regimes that are oppressive or uh, persecute people, but the United States government does not recognize them as, as such. So this is a problem we had with Central American uh, refugees in the 1980s. Um, and now we have the problem of uh, families and unaccompanied minors coming from Central American countries who do not fit easily into the asylum laws. So we'll have more discussion on that. Another way that the, the laws are, are, or the discretionary 
you, uh, enforcement of laws um, is the, the question of, um, you know, types of unauthorized presence. So 30 to 30, uh, some 30 percent of all the undocumented in this country are visa overstays, right? They're people who did not come across the border. They came through JFK or another airport on a legitimate visa as a tourist or business or whatever, and they overstayed the visa. And we don't really have uh, much attention to those persons. It's actually very hard to find them. Um, so all of our attention is on the Latinos at the southern border, right? So in these very many ways, um, our, our laws create um, people with unauthorized presence. Um, it's, I think, the big, the big takeaway I, I have felt in my own research is not that undocumented people, it's that there's something wrong with them or their character uh, or their motives, but that the law creates a situation where some people can come with visas and other people um, cannot, or it's extremely difficult for them to come. So I think that's why we intuit a moral sensibility about the position of many of our undocumented workers, that we don't think it's really their fault. We recognize that they become part of our communities, um, and uh, we don't think they should be ripped from their families or their homes um, by, by the immigration authorities. So I just want to, do I have time to give another a little historical example of? One, one more. OK, yeah, one example. OK, so I just want to talk a little bit about about um, something uh, in our history that's parallel to sanctuary movement, and that is the Underground Railroad and the actions of Northerners to uh, defy the fugitive slave laws before the Civil War. And in fact, I think some, some historians believe that, that if there was one thing that made the Civil War inevitable, it was the fugitive slave law that compelled Northerners to turn over uh, runaway slaves in the North. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, my colleague Eric Foner has a new book out on the Underground Railroad where he traces the origins of it to New York City um, with uh, the formation of vigilance committees in the 1930s. These were uh, citizens who were, were vigilant about protecting free black people in New York from being kidnapped and sold into slavery in the South. And they went from there. Um, there were vigilance committees uh, formed in other uh, cities and states. Um, and they went from there to, from preventing kidnapping to actually assisting people who were running away from slavery. And this gave rise to this network of assistance that we know as the Underground Railroad. And I think what's interesting for our purposes is that um, a ruling in 1842 um, by the Supreme Court explained, I mean, that there was always, in, it was actually in the Constitution that you should turn over fugitives, right? But it was never clear exactly how that was supposed to happen. And in 1842, the Supreme Court said that it was the job of the federal government to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. So that gave northern states an option to declare states' rights, basically, to take the states' rights principle and say they were not going to enforce the federal law. It was not their job. And this is directly parallel, I think, to what many cities are saying is that it's not the, the job of local jurisdictions or state jurisdictions to enforce immigration laws. Now, in 1850, Congress passed another fugitive slave law, which ramped up the penalties if so anybody who refused to cooperate with federal marshals in rounding up fugitive slaves was subject to fel felony prosecution. So this did not stop people from protecting runaway slaves. In fact, it incited a greater movement, and you even had riots in the street with mobs of people trying to protect uh, slave, uh, runaway slaves from federal marshals and, and basically slave catchers and bounty hunters. So I think that, for me, the takeaway for us is that the idea of sanctuary has both um, uh, a lot of ground for creative legal usage, but at the end of the day, it's a question of solidarity, it's a question of civil disobedience, and it's a question of how many people are willing to put their bodies on the line to protect uh, uh, people who are faced with unjust deportations. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, because we'll talk more about sanctuary yeah. later. All right, okay. thanks. Uh, Nisha, so Commissioner, uh, Donald Trump launched his campaign last year with the now famous attack on 
Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans saying that they were criminals. He recently reaffirmed his intent to deport as many as three million people in the early part of his term, focusing enforcement, he said, on criminals and gang members. He said he will triple the forces of federal deportation agents and is likely to initiate deportation raids. What uh, position has the de Blasio administration taken in response to what seems to be the coming policy from the new uh, administration in Washington? And does the city actually have authority to defy the federal government on some of these issues? Great, so uh, first, thank you so much for having me on this panel. And maybe I'll just start by giving a little bit of context before sort of talking about how the city has responded. For those who don't know, you probably experience this every day living in New York City, but this is a city in which one out of three people are foreign born or immigrants. When you add the children of immigrants, that's 60% of New York City. So um, the, the role that New York City has historically played as a magnet for uh, people from all over the world is um, very much alive and well today in New York City. And the mission of our office is really to be a bridge between city government and New York's many diverse communities. So in the um, aftermath of the election, um, Mayor de Blasio um, spoke out, he did public addresses and sort of consistently reaffirmed the commitment that New York City has to those immigrant communities and to supporting them um, in the midst of a context of a lot of um, uncertainty. So one of the first things we did was just reinforce that many city programs and city services remain available to all, regardless of immigration status. Um, we've had a number of different sort of uh, programs that we've initiated. One um, that was mentioned earlier is the city's municipal ID program, IDNYC. And um, part of the purpose of this program is really to be able to provide identification to New Yorkers who may not be able to get government issued identification or, or have um, challenges retaining that and undocumented immigrants are, are at the top of that list. But we also wanted to create an identification card for all New Yorkers, really something that symbolizes a broad based inclusion within our city in the form of a sort of ID card that you have in your wallet. And we have had in just under two years more than 900,000 New Yorkers sign up for that card. Um, and that's remarkable both because we don't have that many undocumented immigrants in New York City um, and many of the people who have signed up for the car there's a, a lot of diversity in terms of languages spoken we don't ask about immigration status um, but we ha clearly have a lot of people representing the diversity of New York but also we did an evaluation and many people who signed up for the card sort of said they did so partly out of solidarity so this was even before the election and I think part of the message we've been trying to send um, since the election is to say programs like that will continue and um, this notion of sort of solidarity and standing um, alongside um, more vulnerable communities like the undocumented will continue to be part of what New York City is. Um, another service that we um, started uh, building two years ago and that continues today is legal services. Um, there's a number of different programs ranging from deportation defense, which the um, city council funds for detained immigrants, all the way to naturalization services for people who want to become citizens. And there's been a huge amount of investment in those kinds of programs to help people uh, navigate this legal quandary that um, Professor, uh, that, uh, Professor and I mentioned. Um, um, and really critically needed services. So again, reminding New Yorkers, you can call 311, you can sign up for these programs, we won't uh, share your information when you do that. In fact, you're gonna get to sit down with a free, safe um, lawyer who can advise you and guide you as needed. Um, and we've been doing a lot of community engagement. So um, with the city council put out multiple uh, translations of fact sheets that say this, that you can still go to school, um, you can still access health care. Um, your immigration status will not be an issue. You can access the range of other services. We've been convening stakeholders and partners to, to get this message out and to really just reassure people and provide the information that they need kind of in the immediate um, aftermath. And unfortunately, we've also been doing um, workshops and outreach on um, bias crimes and discrimination um, at sort of the same time last year, we've seen it, uh, this year a spike in hate crimes of um, more than 115%. Mm. So that's um, uh, very troubling and I think something that has been added to the work that we've been doing as a city. 
And then finally, I think one thing we're also trying to um, ramp up what, uh, is advocacy uh, at the national level. So Mayor de Blasio works with almost 100 mayors around the country, over 100 mayors around the country, as part of a coalition called Cities for Action. And the idea of this coalition is really to lift up the voice of cities and mayors on the national stage on immigration. What happens in Washington, D.C. in terms of policy very much influences us here on the ground. And adding to advocates' voices, faith leaders' voices, business voices that have already been sort of um, speaking about the importance of immigration issues at the national level, this is a kind of a way to articulate the voice of cities and of mayors. And so that's work that we're going to continue to do, sort of advocating with the Obama administration in their few days uh, left to um, to sort of take action that could perhaps um, continue to support immigrants and also looking forward to the new administration and doing the advocacy we need there. And then finally, um, on the sort of broader question of sanctuary cities and sort of what the city's power is, um, I would say a few things. So I think um, the, the issue, the terminology of sanctuary cities um, has a history to it um, and has a sort of framework around it. But I would say now that the term has become very politicized and has very different meaning. So there's almost a rhetorical battle that's taking place. Um, on the one side, there are cities and others who um, identify as sanctuary cities and use that as a framework in which to lift up all of the great work that cities are doing to support immigrants, not just protect them, but to really enable immigrant families to thrive where they live. Um, on the other hand, there's also a sort of strand of rhetoric that um, sort of, I would argue, starts with um, defining human beings as illegal. Um, that has talked about comprehensive immigration reform and legalization as amnesty, and that now sort of talks about sanctuary cities as places that harbor criminals and harbor sort of um, basically criminal elements in the form of Im uh, uh, immigrants and undocumented immigrants. And there's a number of problems with that framing. One is, in fact, factually, it's not even entirely, uh, it's not accurate um, to say that we are somehow harboring criminals. As an example, the, the city of New York has a law that passed a couple of years ago that determines the extent to which New York City will cooperate with immigration enforcement for individuals who've come into contact with our um, criminal justice system. And on the one hand, the law um, actually says that we will cooperate with immigration enforcement in the context of people who have committed serious and violent felonies. So these are actual convictions of people who've committed serious and violent felonies within um, the recent past. The, the idea behind that is, is public safety and kind of a recognition of that, not a desire to flout um, the law or to sort of disregard public safety, which is what some critics would say, but in fact to recognize that that's important. On the other hand, also saying we will not um, cooperate with ICE in situations where the individuals have committed very low level crimes or have not been convicted at all. They've merely just been charged with these crimes. So not surprisingly, because most New Yorkers are not violent, serious and violent felons, we don't have a huge amount of people who are um, sort of being transferred over to ICE as a result of this policy. Um, but even the, the notion of not cooperating with ICE for individuals who've committed low level crimes or just been um, sort of accused of crimes comes from a public safety perspective as well, where if local police are seen as agents of immigration, it's not going to, certainly not going to encourage um, you know, one third of our, our, our city to step forward to report crimes, to serve as witnesses to crimes. It sort of puts police in a, in a more hostile relationship with the communities that they serve. Um, so I think that's important to note. And then um, this is not a legal opinion, but dusting off sort of some of the stuff that I've been looking at and thinking about what powers the city might have to, to resist um, or to honestly be able to do this within our own powers. One uh, is very clear that, this, that local government should not be um, not even that it can be, but it should not be serving as, as immigration enforcement. And we know that from decisions from the Supreme Court in the recent um, cases around the Arizona um, law that passed that was very anti-immigrant. And, and parts of it asked local law enforcement to arrest people when the local police thought they might be removable from the country. And the Supreme Court said that's not the job of local authorities. So I think we know that. Um, we also know that um, in cases, in many cases, uh, the federal government can't take over. They can't sort of take over your local um, operations, your local police, in order to carry out what's their job. So federal immigration enforcement is their job. They can't commandeer um, our um, cities 
resources to be able to do that. And we know that from cases around things like um, the Brady Act, where um, the Supreme Court actually said you can't have um, local police officers or local jurisdictions doing some of these background checks. And the idea is that it essentially enhances the federal government's ability by being able to take over the police efforts of, of local jurisdictions. Maybe that's useful, um, again, a conservative opinion, but something that could be useful to think about and what powers um, cities and states have in this area. And then finally, most recently, um, in the Affordable Care Act context, we've seen um, the Supreme Court say that the federal government can't essentially hold a gun to a jurisdiction's head by holding uh, back a or demanding or con making conditional a lot of federal funding to comply with federal obligations. And this was in the context of the Medicaid expansion. So there's some interesting things in the law that are going to be debated and hotly contested. Um, again, uh, not a legal opinion, but just some of the stuff to think about, whether we're actually breaking any laws or whether in the context of this, this country's federalism, we're perfectly entitled to actually say, this is how we want to act and how we want to behave in terms of the extent to which we cooperate with the federal government on, on immigration enforcement. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, Camille, uh, we've been hearing contradictory messages from Donald Trump on what he intends to do about a program known as DACA which gave protection from deportation and work authorization to more than 700,000 young immigrants in this country who became undocumented after they arrived here when they were children. On one hand, the president-elect has said that he would quickly cancel all of President Obama's executive actions, and DACA is one of those. Uh, on the other hand, uh, recently the president-elect has suggested that there might be some resolution there short of uh, turning the information that these young people provided over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement and initiating deportation proceedings and removing them from the country. Uh, so what uh, is your coalition doing uh, to uh, prepare for the possibility that uh, DACA might be canceled, and um, are you expecting that that's what will happen? I think we've given up on expecting anything. We've sort of uh, we're just sort of taking it day by day, and we don't know we don't know what's coming, and that's what's made it very hard um, to to react to the events of the last month. But I think DACA is a really interesting example and an, and an interesting place to start because in so many ways DACA encapsulates so much of what is going on with immigrant communities right now and, and we can use it to extrapolate on so much and I think the push for DACA and the fight for DACA which itself was born out of the fight for the DREAM Act taught us so much about how to move advocacy forward and how to move an immigration agenda forward um, and, and really change the way we handle things, to, we handle that conversation and who we bring into that conversation in the first place because it was really the first time that the affected individuals got out there and spoke out and put themselves in the line of danger, which is precisely why we're so worried about them now because they really stuck their necks out. And when uh, President-elect Trump was elected, um, we, they, they felt like they were sitting ducks. And you're right, the rhetoric over the last few few weeks has sort of left us a little puzzled because they went from we're definitely getting rid of them to well let's see what we can do and then we've seen senate republicans actually work on a bipartisan effort to introduce a bill that the bridge act that could potentially protect those uh, roughly 750,000 youth i think the short answer to your question is we're getting ready by getting ready to throw down and, and that's true for DACA recipients, and that's true for refugees, and that's true for every immigrant. And we've learned some lessons from DACA that we're going to bring to all of our communities, that it's important to listen to our communities and hear what they want and, and act on that. Um, DACA taught us how to do outreach because New York, which has such a high immigrant population and one of, had one of the highest estimated rates of eligible individuals for DACA, had actually one of the lowest application rates. So we learned how to get out there and how to get the message to our immigrant communities in new ways and we learn how to deliver legal services to our communities in new ways and the same thing now that we're in this position 
which we didn't expect to be in, but where we're going to be playing defense for four years. But at the same time, we've been playing defense for so long that I think there's a part of us that's itching to just go out there and play offense a little bit too. And, and Dakars and, and with their courage to have coming out and saying, I'm undocumented and afraid and I'm going to do this for myself, for my community members, for my family members have inspired us to do that. Um, and within, I think it was 10 days after the election, even less than that, there were 15,000 people in the streets. Um, out there marching, all we kind of circled around Trump Tower. Um, I don't know, we took this really weird route through Midtown, but because you had to accommodate 15,000 people all of a sudden in the streets of Manhattan, showing solidarity with immigrants. And that started with DACA. And so we're going to, you know, obviously we're very supportive of, of legislation like the Bridge Act that um, Senator Graham and, and Senator Durbin introduced. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna hope to support that. We're gonna support any effort to protect, to to provide these. You know, I'm I'm also not a great fan of the term sanctuary. It, it creates images that I don't think are particularly accurate. But where we're going to try to protect in any way we can from ICE from intervening and and coming and and using the information that they have. I don't think it's practicable to go after all of them in the first place. And I think what we're expecting possibly is that they will be allowing the work permits to expire. So maybe rescinding the program saying we won't let people renew, we'll let the work permits expire. But I think that's they're going to find that it's actually a lot harder to just sort of make 750,000 uh, work authorizations disappear. And we're going to use that messaging to sort of continue to lift up our immigrant communities. And we've really seen an unprecedented amount of organizing in the last month. Some things that we've never seen before, you know, and, and I think this country historically go, you know, we saw it in the civil rights era where something happens and it sort of ser serves as a cat uh, catalyst to, to greater action. And I think now we have social media, which has really, really blown that up. And, and those tactics we learned from Dakars and from Dreamers, and, and they showed us the power of using social media to get your message out and to influence policy. They stopped deportations by sharing Facebook. Um, they used tactics that we had never up until then thought of. And so, so how we're getting ready is basically that. We're going to be back in the streets on Sunday, showing our immigrant neighbors that we're, we're in solidarity with them. And, and that really is the message, right? This is not a message for all of those who have gone out and saying protesting doesn't work. This isn't about a, we're going to protest until they decide not to give him the presidency. I mean, we get how elections work. We understand it. But we're going to be out there to show our immigrant neighbors, our one in three or, or two in three, that when you stand, we stand with you. Because if you fall, we fall with you. That's going to start with DACA. It's going to extend to our refugees. And eventually, it's going to extend to our immigration communities. Um, I'm just going to take a little minute here because I think it may be something that m might be useful for the audience. Could you just explain what DACA is oh, and yes. why it's so easy for this president-elect to cancel it and make it go away? Just Can you just explain? Is, is it immigration status? Is it what? What is DACA? Exactly? So DACA is nothing really. It's it's. Um, <laughs> don't tell the people who no, got DACA. <laughs> it's, 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 it's it means it's, a lot. It's nothing, but it's a it is a work permit. So. It's it's nothing in the sense that it's not status. Right. It's not. It's not even a legal permission to be in the United States. It's more of a, we're not going to bother with trying to deport you or remove you from the United States. Um, DACA comes from actually a very, very long and established concept of deferred action, which itself is part of prosecutorial discretion. And um, I mean, basically, any one of you who's ever watched Law & Order, when Jerry Orbach decided not to charge the guy with the crime because he kind of had a soft moment and thought the guy was like, that's prosecutorial discretion. Um, so expand that to the immigration concept. Born in New York. Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. So expand that to the immigration. Hey, Law & Order got me through the bar exam in law school. So <laughs> expand that to immigration, and you sort of have this idea that law enforcement can never Immigration enforcement is never going to get all of the individuals that potentially don't have a legal right to be in the United States, right? Um, there's the 11 million undocumented, but then there's all the other ones who have visas who may have done, you know, taken a, a misstep at some point, even unknowingly. So law enforcement has to make a decision as to how they're going to use their resources. And President Obama in 2012 
decided that those resources are not well spent on deporting individuals who are here without immigration status through no fault of their own. So he, grant, he, allowed, he formalized the way that people can make requests for deferred action, meaning for the government to not deport them, by creating this application process, Im imposing a filing fee on it, and allowing them, in exchange, authorization to work, and in certain times, authorization to request permission to travel abroad, which is very significant um, to individuals who haven't been home. Now, we're talking about kids or, or individuals who are brought here as children, right? Two years old, five years old, nine years old, any before 15 years old is the cutoff. Um, and, and it allowed them to stay here and to work. But it's not a status, and that's important. It's not an immigration status, meaning that it can be taken away at any time. It was, uh, President Obama made, took action he, it's not even an executive order, which actually has certain ramifications and certain uh, processes by which you can remove it. He just decided, I'm going to tell my guys to not have to go after this group of people. And so it's extremely easy for a new president to come in and say, I'm telling my guys to go after these people. And by the way, you have their addresses, and you know where they live, and you have their social security numbers, and you know who their family members are. And that's, that's the real fear is that it can go away in the blink of an eye. It's just a decision. The president can wake up tomorrow and decide, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, now, in reality, politically, is that savvy? Probably not. Does that matter with the new administration? We'll figure that out. <laughs> OK. Heather, uh, since 2014, tens of thousands of families from Central America have come to the US border asking for asylum and saying they were running from very pervasive and vicious criminal violence often in their home countries, especially in El Salvador and Honduras. Uh, and in recent months, that uh, pe 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 people may not be aware of this, but this surge is, start has, is, is happening again. The numbers that we're seeing at the border are comparable to what we saw in 2014. There's a big new movement of people from Central America coming to the border. Many of those families have been released and allowed to pursue their asylum claims in immigration courts, but across the country, despite the very chilling violence that these families are talking about experiencing in their home countries, the great majority, I think, of those cases are failing. Uh, the, the families are f not achieving their asylum claims, and they're ending up with final orders of deportation. So I'm wondering, what is the situation in New York for the Central American families? Are they doing better? Is the, are the, what, do the courts um, have a more sympathetic view of this uh, particular group of asylees? And uh, what, just very briefly at the end, if you can say, what do you anticipate could happen in the immigration courts with the new president? Sure. Um, so, you know, my, my office actually opened in 1986 to uh, provide representation to war refugees, to Guatemalans and, and Salvadorans that were fleeing the civil wars and massive govern, government repression in those countries in the 80s. Um, in, the decades since, business has continued to boom, essentially thanks in part to uh, weak, corrupt, and often absent governing, governing authority and the rise of increasingly powerful, pow powerful transnational criminal organizations. Um, which has led to, which has led, I mean, the Northern Triangle of Central America right now is one of the most violent regions on Earth outside of active war zones. And so because of that, as Julia mentioned, we're having um, sort of unprecedented, almost unprecedented numbers of, um, of Central Americans, many of them women and children, um, coming to our southern border, expressing a fear of return, um, and, and ultimately being put in removal proceedings. Um, many of them have family in New York, and so they're ultimately released to New York City so that they can fight out their case. And that's when my organization and other nonprofits doing removal defense enter. Um, 
to what makes asylum so difficult and why it's especially difficult for Central Americans is asylum is not just for anybody who's afraid of returning. It's in fact limited to people who have a fear of persecution um, either by the government or by an, a, an individual or group that the government's unable to control because of their race religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So who, what does that leave out? It leaves people who are fleeing generalized violence. It leaves out people who are fleeing um, criminal activity, um, which is particularly difficult when most of the people fleeing El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras right now are fleeing these very powerful transnational criminal organizations, the Mara Salvatrucha, the Mara 18 being the two main gangs down there, as well as narco-trafficking organizations and even Mexican um, cartels that are operating in the region because basically the, these weak and corrupt governments have made a very business-friendly environment for organized crime. Um, and so because of that, and when you're representing a, a Central American asylum seeker, you have to get over this sort of presumption that they're fleeing criminal activity or they're fleeing generalized violence, which would make them ineligible for, um, for protection. And so this requires a lot of really, it requires a lot of really creative lawyering and experienced asylum litigators, to be frank. Um, and I think in large part because of that, in the New York Immigration Court, I think we see higher levels of success than we do in other areas. And I think a large part of that is due to increased access to representation for indigent immigrants, which recent arrivals from Central America almost, almost always are. Um, having access to competent representation can make or break your asylum case. Now, it's still difficult, but when we've been litigating these cases, I've been litigating these cases for almost 10 years, so that experience is helpful. You learn about what works and doesn't. So for instance, one of the things that we try to work to, to persuade a, um, immigration judges in New York is to treat these transnational criminal organizations not just as sort of criminal gangs as we think of them here, but as actually as sophisticated groups that are either acting as de facto governing authorities where there is an absence of a governing authority, where there's a political vacuum, or groups that are actively competing with the state for uh, access to power and influence, such that people who resist that authority or who r resist that, um, that norm, are they being singled out just for criminal activity or is, can, this be, um, can this take on a political dimension? Um, we also, many of, the, many of the people who are fleeing right now are victims of very severe gender violence, domestic violence and other gender violence. And we have in recent years gotten some, um, some helpful uh, court precedent uh, saying that women who've been subjected to very severe uh, domestic violence who live in countries where they can't depend on their own government for protection, um, that they may be eligible for asylum. But these are not textbook claims. And before I came to New York, I was representing Ethiopian uh, refugees. And all of my clients were opposition political activists who'd been targeted by the government because of their political opinions. It was very straightforward asylum law. None of my Central American claims are. But because many more immigrants in New York are represented, um, and, and this is in large part actually thanks to, um, as Nisha kind of brought, uh, brought up, um, significant funding, a significant financial commitment by the New York City Council to funding specifically removal defense, which is really, I mean, there's Im immigrant services broadly defined, but removal defense is a very resource heavy um, investment. And the New York City Council has been very active in providing universal representation for people who are detained and in providing significant representation um, by funding nonprofits who are doing removal defense for unaccompanied minors and for the families from Central America um, that, are, that, are entering, that are entering right now and that are in removal proceedings. And I think that is 
can that makes a big difference in, in why in New York um, we do see higher rates of success for our Central American asylum claims than in other parts of the country. Um, in terms of how that may change or what we may what we may see in the future, um, in some ways yes, in some ways no. Um, unlike DACA, you can't just erase asylum law, right? Our asylum law is based on um, treaty, international treaty obligations, statutes, and years and years and years of case of, of case law of, of precedent, um, and so it's it's harder to unravel that. Um, at the same time, courts matter, uh, judges matter a lot, um, and that's where basically the the process can be made easier if you have immigration judges that have a more expansive understanding of what what an asylum claim might look like. If you have opposing counsel for the Department of Homeland Security who are open and willing and authorized to negotiate on harder claims or to negotiate on fairly clear claims that everybody can kind of agree this is this is a, a this is an asylum claim or they can make it very hard by having immigration judges that have a very limited view of what an asylum seeker what a successful asylum claim is and opposing counsel that are not able or willing to work with you to to stipulate to um, to come to an agreement on kind of what the right answer is in these cases. Um, and to give a sort of example of where, of how courts come into play, um, Julia had mentioned in the beginning this idea of, of raids, right, of immigration raids. Um, we in New York had immigration raids under the Bush administration. ICE um, had, it was called the Operation Return to Sender, and they were carrying out middle of the night warrantless home raids where they were going to people's homes in the middle of the night they didn't have warrants. They were kind of pushing their way into people's homes, and everybody was getting swept up. So you had undocumented immigrants who had never had any interaction with, with law enforcement or with immigration and customs enforcement that were suddenly placed in removal proceedings. Um, we represented a, num a number of these individuals and argued that these middle-of-the-night warrantless home raids were so egregious, egregiously unconstitutional that no evidence that was obtained as a result of them should be used to remove someone, should be used to deport someone. And this, these were, there were claims like this brought up all, all around the country. Um, and we, brought, we argued these claims all the way up to, up to the federal court in the Second Circuit. And the Second Circuit agreed with us. And they said that any evidence that Immigration and Customs Enforcement gets as a result of these middle of the night warrantless unconstitutional home raids can't be used to remove someone. That matters, and that's law we have in the Second Circuit, and that's law, that law applies to ICE in New York regardless of who the president is. So that's where kind of we can, that in, in some ways that protects us, but it also shows how vulnerable we can be based on who is making decisions in immigration court up to the federal court of appeals. All right, I have one question uh, that I'm gonna oppose to Nisha here, but, but anyone can uh, jump in on this, uh, which is uh, in July of 2015, a young woman was shot to death while she was strolling on a pier with her father in San Francisco which was perhaps the city in the entire country that has the longest standing self-declared sanctuary city. And uh, the man who confessed to this crime was a Mexican immigrant with seven felony convictions who had been deported from the United States five times uh, previously. And, it became clear that the fact that this man was on the street uh, had to do with a standoff and a miscommunication between the San Francisco Sheriff and Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And this has been a case that Donald Trump has spoken about in his <laughs> rallies and he's evoked the, the situation where you have this case, uh, the Steinle case, and other cases of Americans who have been killed by uh, immigrants who are out of legal status. And so are you not worried that this could happen in New York and have a profound effect, political effect, or at least on the 
whole concept of New York sanctuary? Yeah, so it's a, um, it's a good question. I think kind of to back to some of what I was saying earlier, I think first and foremost, kind of crime fighting in New York, um, we believe should be done by the law enforcement sort of by our crime fighters, um, NYPD and law enforcement. So I think that's first and foremost. But then, as I mentioned, sort of the, um, the law that we have in place in New York sort of seeks this balance, right, between um, actually cooperating with Immigration and Customs Enforcement in instances where individuals have committed serious and violent felonies. Um, there aren't loads of those people um, in the city. And then um, also balancing, on the other hand, individuals who haven't um, had sort of significant criminal uh, convictions <laughs> or any at all um, who can nevertheless come into contact with the criminal justice system. So that's sort of how we've been balancing um, in some ways to address this kind of a policy. Um, and what I would also say um, is that the kind of whole issue of immigration enforcement and the, um, the way in which ICE will tell local law enforcement um, that they're interested in somebody first, um, they often find out about it from fingerprints. So somebody gets arrested, they get fingerprinted, those fingerprints are shared with the FBI, they're also shared shared with the Department of Homeland Security. So then they can ask for, okay, we want this person. And the kind of traditional practice had been to issue a detainer request, which means even after a person um, has been in local custody and they would otherwise be released for whatever reason, we would be asked to hold that person for up to 48 hours afterwards. And in some courts around the country, those practices have been challenged um, as not meeting various Fourth Amendment requirements, and courts have found that that's true. And so there's sort of liability on that side as well in terms of um, being asked to do engage in practices as localities that might be unconstitutional. So there's a lot of balancing that happens in these policies that I think is challenging for cities to, to navigate and to negotiate. I think in New York, um, with the city council, we feel like we've reached um, a balance on that front, but um, it's it, it, tricky waters to navigate for sure. And May, I wanted to ask you, uh, it seems to me that with Donald Trump, we have not a policy change, as we have a <laughs> paradigm change, we have a, a, a historic shift in the way he portrays immigration and its contribution to American society. That I, I, if I'm, I might be getting my dates wrong here, but I can't, at least since 1965, there's been a sort of dominant narrative that yeah, so you'll correct me, but you know, but the, the idea that, in, that immigrants bring innovation, that they bring, you know, they, they start from the bottom up, that they lift the economy, that the diversity is a wellspring of American identity, this is the opposite this is a popular, of what Donald Trump has articulated. Right? And, I, and I think many Americans believe that, um, but there's also uh, been, uh, alongside it, a parallel uh, nativist sentiment that's been very strong, you know, and not just in Arizona, but, you know, in, in California. Um, I mean, in California, the, um, the proposition that required, um, you know, uh, s teachers and nurses and, you know, uh, not just law enforcement to turn over people who are undocumented, that got struck down in the courts because it's not only not the job of the police, local police, to um, turn over uh, people who are out of status is certainly not the job of school teachers and you know hospital doctors and nurses, etc. So, um, but that was a proposition that passed. Um, in, in, it was a referendum in California. So I think we've seen uh, two parallel discourses, and um, and it's it's. I mean, it's easy to say, well, one is in the big cities and the other is in the, you know, in the heartland. I don't think it actually um, is that simple, you know. Um, I mean, I was just thinking in terms of, um, I mean, I think New York has it right in terms of balancing um, its, its cooperation with uh, immigration enforcement. Um, but, you know, people don't, people don't get as upset about immigrants who are assaulted <laughs> you know, by, uh, by racist thugs. Uh, you know, this, this is a common occurrence that happens, the violence enacted against immigrants. And you don't have to go that far out of New York City. You just have to go to Suffolk County to see uh, a very disturbing recent history of attacks against uh, immigrants uh, who are assumed to be undocumented. I mean, they don't actually know uh, when they attack them. So I think, you know, in this country we've had a very long history of both 
pro and anti-immigrant sentiment. And, um, and it's not so simple to say that it ebbs and flows with the economy, because in the 1990s, when we had a lot of anti-immigration sentiment, the economy was booming. But the economy was also shifting in significant ways so that um, you know, what we now call the effects of globalization, right? But what we really mean is the, um, the reduction of manufacturing jobs, um, the, the extreme polarization of uh, income and wealth inequality, um, creation of many uh, jobs in the lower strata of the workforce that were filled by immigrants. Um, this, so they weren't actually taking jobs from steel workers or coal miners or auto workers, right? These were other areas of the economy. But so you had a great resentment against immigrants even when you had an economy that was growing, right? So that's, that's something that's a little different um, right now. But you could even say that was the case in the early 20th century or the late 19th century when there was a big influx of immigrant labor that also filled parts of the economy that were growing, right? This is part of our industrialization, uh, urbanization in the United States. The people who were losing jobs were not losing them to immigrants, they were losing them because there was a reorganization of the workplace. So I think these are, these are trends that, um, uh, that just don't go back and forth like a pendulum. I think they, all, they exist alongside each other and sometimes um, the Congress or local, local jurisdictions have friendlier or not as friendly laws in place. So a lot, a lot matters in terms of politics and how politics are mobilized. I will say that about illegal immigration, it's a really funny political question because many people who say they are pro-immigrant stop at the question of the undocumented. They say, I'm for immigrants, but I'm only for legal, the legal ones. And I don't think they understand the conditions that create um, the so-called illegal alien. Uh, that's one point. A lot of people will say, well, my ancestors came in the early 20th century. They came to the Lower East Side. You know, they worked their way up. They were all legal. You know, they came the right way. They were all legal. Well, if they came... They had their visas, right? right there were, no, the visas. Where there there were no, no visas. There were no right. visas. There were no restrictions. There were no numerical restrictions at all. So if everybody's legal, there's no great honor in being legal, right? If, <laughs> right? So it's only after 1924 where we have a numerical limit on, the, on who, how many people can come. And then you have a problem, of, and then you have a distinction that gets made. So, but people respond to this question of undocumented status in funny ways, right? A lot of people say they're against, you know, it's, to me it's kind of a proxy for racism, right? Because they're not screaming and yelling about the Irish and Polish undocumented. They're screaming and yelling about Latinos, basically. Um, but, but it's very, also very abstract, you know, who's the, the, the kind of the, the boogie of the undocumented or the illegal alien. And a lot of people say, well, they're against it, but then they make a lot of exceptions, right? The gardener is an exception, the nanny's an exception. Mm -hmm. Even people who work in, you know, offices where there are other immigrants, those people are fine. You know, so when people know an immigrant, um, regardless of their status, they often have a very different view up close and personal, and yet they have an abstract idea of what's what's unlawful, and I think it's been a very um, it's it's been a very uh, significant kind of political play to target on the question of illegality as a way of getting around the question of race. Wow, that's interesting. So we have about 15 minutes left. So why don't we take some questions from the audience? Is that Peter? Is that Mike live over there? So so if you could. Raise your hand, I'll call on you, and then you could you come up to the microphone? Yeah, well, let's start over here. Is that? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ida, and I'd like to um, ask uh, the panel, and specifically the woman here from the Bla de Blasio Can you administration. Can stand up close to that microphone, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'd like to um, address the issue of uh, hate crimes and um, how vulnerable people are feeling um, in the city and uh, wondering what we can do on, I'm from Queens, and what we can do on a local level to um, protect our people and to not make them feel so vulnerable. 
When my daughter was young, and I don't know if this is uh, still the case, but there was a program in our area called Safe Haven. And um, various um, stores had decals where a kid who felt uh, bullied or in some way um, in danger could go into the store and, be, and feel protected. Um, is that a program that still exists? At what level did it exist in, the, in those times? And can it be re-energized? Um, and what about our um, churches and synagogues and um, uh, temples and so on? Uh, can there be some kind of a citywide or even borough-wide um, system uh, where people can go if they're feeling in danger. Specifically, I know in, in our area, um, women, uh, Muslim women in particular, are feeling very vulnerable, even that's walking great. Yeah, the thank street. you. So um, that's my question. So I can start um, and say, I think first and foremost, um, it's very important to report these problems when they happen. We surprisingly don't get as many reports. Um, if uh, there's a sort of uh, bias incident or discrimination in incident, just being able to call 311, and there are actually the City Commission on Human Rights um, handles this work and has staff who can help follow up on those issues. Obviously, if there's an actual crime being committed, calling 911 and reporting that to the police, I think is very important. Um, a second action to take at the local level um, has been just hosting community forums where people know what their rights are, they know what their options might be, um, and it's also its own kind of safe space to be able to um, learn about what the options are. We have been doing a lot of them, um, my agency, but also various other city agencies in partnership with community organizations, with faith organizations, and I'll have to say the turnout um, at these uh, events and council members, various other people, has been very high, and I think there's a lot of interest in sort of solid in that respect, too. Um, some groups have been doing really innovative things around this, so on the issue of sort of Muslim women and, and the sort of vulnerability. Um, one group uh, sort of recruited volunteers to accompany people during their, their um, commutes, and I think in like a matter of hours had hundreds of volunteers who sort of did this, and I think an incredible symbol of sort of what New Yorkers are like. Um, and so I think that all of that work um, can be very useful, and so we'd love to talk to you afterwards about potentially um, doing some workshops um, where you are. I don't know about the Safe Haven program, but can find out sort of if it's, um, or maybe others do, but uh, sort of still existing or something that um, could be brought back in some way, but we'll, we'll find out. Did you have a question? Yeah, why don't you, and then is does somebody, are there other questions out here? So somebody could, yeah, do you want to step, get ready and step up to the microphone? So you go ahead and ask your question and then. So I'm Christine Sadowski. I'm an executive director with the YWCA in Orange County, north of the city. And one of the things that I hope to hear tonight was what the pros and cons are of trying to form more sanctuary cities. We're trying to decide what that conversation should be and how to create not only safe spaces um, temporarily, but, you know, more kind of formalized legal and have conversations with municipal leaders about them. So I'd be curious to see if we think that's kind of across the board a good strategy or has some problems that we should look at some other options. Um, so I can take this one as well. So one, um, if your county is interested in joining cities for Action, you should and talk more about that. Um, I would say um, instead of being even hung up on the concept of a sanctuary city or whether or not to be, it's more what are the policies and programs you can put in place to support immigrant communities. And so many cities have been doing incredible innovative work from language access to municipal IDs to legal services, um, you name it. Um, there's a lot of great work that's happening in cities, uh, not just in New York, but across the country. And I think starting to adopt those by itself sends an incredible message about what kind of place you are, um, and so very happy to talk with you about that, but I think there's a lot of um, resources as well to be able to look look up online um, on these kinds of, but it's, it's more the actions in addition to the sort of words and messages that go out that I think are the most valuable. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, in addition to what the commissioner said, there's 
I understand. I think that cities right now who, who've sort of taken on this label of sanctuary have feel a little bit in the crosshairs because of, we don't know what the new administration, the incoming administration could do and what does that mean for funding and does that mean that they will be targeted. But I think from the community perspective, it is so important. And as someone who works day in and day out with communities, immigrant communities across the state, I don't think we can underscore right now, I don't think I can tell you enough how afraid immigrants are. And, and that translates in very, very practical ways. Um, people are afraid of leaving their houses and going to, and going to work. They're afraid of going to the doctor's office because they're afraid they'll report them to ICE. Children are going to school afraid their parents won't be home when they come home that night. I mean, the fear is so real and anything you can do at any level to send a signal that you take that seriously and that you want to be a support to them. Maybe it doesn't mean, I don't, I don't want to use the word wall, but maybe it doesn't mean building a moat around your city that ice can't cross, right? Maybe it doesn't mean creating a human chain around a person, although it could. I'm a grassroots advocate. I'm not going to say no. Um, but, but maybe, but it just says, you know, that we're here and we're taking these concerns seriously. I don't think you should underestimate how impactful that is. And I can assure you that I have seen in the last three years since Commissioner Agarwal and Mayor de Blasio have gone out and have made such a concerted effort to reach out to immigrant communities, how much more trusting immigrant communities have become of government than we've ever seen before. And that makes us all stronger and it makes us all safer because it's people buying goods in our stores. It's people going to work and supporting our services. It's people reporting crimes. I mean, this lists us all up in a very, very practical way, but don't underestimate the fear. And, and to the woman before who was asking, you know, what can we do to make people feel safe? Reach out to your immigrant neighbors. Know that they're not going to speak your language, probably very literally all the time. But reach out and, and just, you know, when a smile, uh, helping pick up groceries that were knocked out of your hand, sitting next to you so that your child doesn't feel vulnerable on the subway, that means so much. And please, as New Yorkers, don't underestimate that ever. Can I, I'd like to add one other, one other point also. Um, I mean, I, I'm not opposed to um, cities or jurisdictions who are wary of using the term sanctuary, but I also support it. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a kind of solidarity that's important. But the bottom line is the policies that you put into place. And one thing I think, um, not just just cities and counties, but also organizations can think about um, as a kind of non-compliance is how to uh, protect your data. Right, I mean, we live in a data-heavy world, right? Um, there's information about everybody, everywhere. Um, so at my university, right, they're concerned that, um, that there be no data, that we have no data on the immigration status of our students. So if they come and they want our data, they will, there won't be anything to give them, right? That's something that's being discussed. This is something that having 900,000 people with a New York ID is great because it's really hard to go through 900,000 records, right, and they won't find anything. I mean, it would be very, very difficult for them to find anything. Um, I was at a forum when a woman was there from a community health clinic. They want to they wanna go through their data, right? So there are all kinds of ways that you can, um, I mean, libraries, I mean, libraries were scrubbing their borrowing records so that the government wouldn't know who was taking out what books, right? So you live in a climate where the data becomes uh, a weapon of, of, of the state, those of you creating those, those databases actually have some control over, over what you have. Um, so I don't know about tech, you know, I wouldn't know, know how to tell you to scrub your data, but I think this is something that it's a kind of non-compliance that can be done in a very widespread way. It could be done, I mean, I'm here talking about it, but it could be done quietly. Um, <laughs> You know, you don't have to <laughs> announce that you're doing it, but you just won't have it, right? I mean, during the Vietnam War, when they tried to limit, they tried to, um, there was a student exemption from the draft, and then the, the government tried to um, say, well, they would only give exemptions to people in the top half of their class, right? So Columbia University stopped ranking students. So we said, well, we don't know who's in the top half or the bottom half, right? So there's you know, people are creative. You can find all kinds of ways to resist without, ten without breaking the law, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be done. Um, Camille, do you know one of the 
the legal initiatives that uh, I've heard about in other places around the country is an effort to uh, litigate so that uh, the federal government would not be able to transfer the information on DACA students that I um, mean DACA people that's currently a, a, at USCIS and the, to, to block <laughs> the transfer of that information over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is the enforcement arm that would be the de deportation arm. Is, is anything like that going on in New York? Is that? Um, I, no, I haven't heard anything like that. I don't know if Commissioner Agarwal has that. I haven't, yeah. I actually haven't heard of that strategy in New York at all. That's a good point you're raising. Yeah. I'll get back to you on it. All right. <laughs> good, D question? Any questions out there? Um, yes, thank you. Um, Hi, uh, this is great panel. Thank you all for your work. Um, I was curious, um, I, I have learned a little bit more about undocumented populations that are not Latino, and I think there's been a lot of shorthand on the panel, like, Lat you know, that we're talking about Latinos. Um, do we have a sense of what the populations are in New York who are undocumented, who are not Latino? and like what the size of those populations may be? So um, unfortunately, we have a fantastic Department of City Planning that has its own demographic unit, um, and they do amazing analyses of uh, the demographics of New York City, including immigrants. Um, but unfortunately, I think we have sort of very rough cuts about um, about half a million are undocumented, but don't have um, sort of lots of um, information about sort of who those folks are. Um, and, you know, there's good questions to ask about whether that's something that we want to probe further on as well. Um, you know, so I think we know sort of rough analyses of that kind of thing, but um, use other proxy information as we're thinking about our outreach for programs. So things like languages spoken, et cetera, um, are some of the ways in which we were able to map where we wanted to focus our resources for doing outreach for the municipal IT program, for example. Um, but I think really good reasons to not ask people about their immigration status, um, I think for a lot of these programs, which would provide that information, but has the countervailing um, fact that we don't, if we don't need to ask about immigration status, we won't. Um, I know in, in the New York Immigration Court, a significant percentage of New Yorkers in removal proceedings are Chinese. There's a very large Chinese community, um, many in removal proceedings, many who are applying for asylum based on persecution, um, based on family planning policies in China, as well as uh, religious and political persecution there. And it's, I would just add to that, even though I'm the moderator, there's considerable evidence that for the Asian immigrant communities, they are much more fearful and much le they, have, they have much less of a sense of solidarity and confidence in coming forward. I th do you think that's fair, May, for me so. to say that? You know, the, f we, we know, for example, from the DACA program, when people were invited to come forward, the Korean immigrants, Chinese immigrants, the Asian Filipinos, they were very reluctant uh, uh, and much harder to persuade. <laughs> And they may, you know, a lot of people might be sitting home going, well, I told you so. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I, you know, I think those communities are, are, you know, probably the level of fear is probably quite intense and much harder to detect and identify and describe. Yeah. Another question? I do. We have time for, yeah, um, go ahead. Camilla, this is a question for you. You mentioned that there have been new ways of reaching communities. Could you talk about some of those new ways, why they've developed, what, what has been effective? Yeah, it actually kind of builds on the point Julia was just making about Asian communities, which is that immigrants are very distrustful, um, especially undocumented immigrants are very distrustful by nature. And we've, through various ways, learned to create networks that encompass community-based organizations and sort of, um, using individuals who are already in the community and who speak the language, but also have that sort of shared 
experience in the United States to get the message out there. And um, one thing that, for example, a, a new concept that's emerged in the last couple of years, shamelessly stolen from Obamacare, by the way, called the Navigator Model, um, which was developed when we, it started. they started thinking of it when we thought we were going to get legalization in 2013, and then it pivoted when we thought we were going to get an expansion of DACA and new deferred action programs in 2014, which uses community-based organizations and their staff and community members to get the message out about what is this program and um, who qualifies and what documents are you going to need, and then helping those individuals get those documents together before they go see the lawyer and building on trust. Trust is very, very critical. Um, so that's one way I think we've become, and again, this just goes to show how lucky we are in New York City, but um, working a lot more with ethnic media and in New York at, at CUNY, actually, the journalism school has a center for community and ethnic media that really gets the word out just and going into places to provide services that they trust, like schools, like libraries, not making them come into the city, um, into, you know, like glass buildings and, um, and also working around their schedule. So making night, weekends, um, sort of, and, and I think Cal has always been amazing. I mean, Cal is in, in the basement of a church and, and, you know, a lot of immigrants are very religious and so there's already that level of comfort. Also, everyone knows that Cal is like the place to be if you need help and that reputation has grown. But um, so ways like that and, you know, using text services, like you can sign up and we'll send you a text alert. Using social media networks is also very effective and, um, and being very careful to the point earlier of how we describe immigrants because I think one of the issues we had with DACA is that we promoted this image of the dreamer as the young valedictorian who was hyper successful and a lot of DACAers didn't, a lot of people who qualified for DACA were, you know, 28, had dropped out of school to support their family, eventually got around to enrolling in an English class and now qualified for DACA and had no idea because they didn't identify with the young 18 year old high school diploma holding person on the front of the brochure. So. Just to add to what Camille is saying, I think one thing we found is as a, sort of a, a priority is really not letting bureaucracy burden mm -hmm. the relationship between an immigrant seeking assistance and in our case it's attorneys. So I mean, we operate a walk-in clinic, we're open every day or every weekday, you don't need to make an appointment which allows especially people who are doing day labor or construction, if it rains, everybody comes in and does their legal consultation because you didn't need to make an appointment. You know, or like you get a day, your kids get a day off of school, great day, let's bring them in. That kind of flexibility and not having a lot of steps in or people to kind of navigate in between you and a person who is kind of equipped to talk to you about your legal status and what your um, options are is really essential. Last question. Thank you. You were talking about not sharing DACA data, but they already have, uh, the IRS already has a cache of information, especially for ITIN holders. Um, so these are, this is a population largely undocumented because they have no social. So I was wondering if you had any insight, especially when you've had maybe an experience with the house raids that went on not too long ago as to whether um, this shift in paradigm may lead to use of that information to target businesses um, that have a large amount of individuals with ITIN numbers and do raids in the city. I, I know that there, I do wage and hour litigation in the city. I know that there's a, a very vast amount of employers, especially in the hospitality industry that have many undocumented workers. I don't know that the government would be targeting New York City necessarily, but there was a raid recently in Buffalo, so I was wondering if you had any insight as to... Does everybody know what an ITIN number is, an independent taxpayer number? It's an alternative uh, for people who don't have social security numbers to be able to pay their taxes. Um, yeah, the raids in Buffalo were really scary for us. They were, they were definite, um, and um, just briefly, um, for... Mexican restaurants owned by the same three owners in, in Buffalo in October were targeted by um, ICE agents and they showed up at 11 in the morning, guns drawn into these restaurants, kicked down chairs, put everyone on the ground, supposedly because they were investigating the employers for harboring and wage issues, but they ended up taking the workers. Um, and that was a real reversal of, of President Obama's policies and a real return to Bush era policies. And we're really fearful. Um, and we're, that's something that we're very, very worried about. And Heather sort of alluded to them earlier when, you know, back then we did a lot of litigation. At the end of the day, you need probable cause. Um, we have a constitution. It, it protects us from unreasonable search and seizure. You need probable cause. Are we afraid of the information sharing between agencies? Yes. But just because someone has a night in, you can't really infer from that that they're 
an undocumented immigrant. You know, maybe they're the spouse of an H-1B visa holder who doesn't have the permission to work and because they didn't have the work permit couldn't apply for a work, or, you know, or maybe they're an elderly individual who couldn't apply for work authorization because they had no need for it and didn't feel like paying the $365. So you still need probable cause to go after someone. Will they do it? Yes. Will we be ready to, um, you know, to sue? Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Heather's ready to sue. I also know the ACLU just got about $15 million in new donations since in the last month since the election. So I'm pretty sure they're ready to sue as well. And, you know, for the first time, here we are, lawyers, actually, you know, a force of good. Um, yeah. <laughs> really so, is just the first time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I went to law school. They told me I was just going to be the butt of bad jokes. So I'm kind of relishing this moment. <laughs> I think we're scared. And what they're going to try to do and what they're ultimately going to be able, you know, found to be lawfully allowed to do, there's still a chunk of time in between where these policies are going to be carried out. Um, and we're going to be vigilant and we're going to be organized and we're going to fight back the best we can. We're, we know we have to be on the defense for the next four years and we will be. One, one thing about DACA holders is, I mean, right now, I mean, my students, I have students who are DACA holders um, and they tell me that, um, a lot of them have been uh, kind of screwed up because they're, uh, when they reapplied, um, they're, so, they're so backlogged in issuing new permits that some of them go out of status and their jobs go like that. As soon as their work permit expires and they haven't received their new one, they can't work. So, um, uh, so I'm not sure how that is tracked, you know, how that data is tracked, but you know, the employers know. And a lot of them who work on campus, on campus jobs, they know right away that they're, they're fired. So, um, uh, so that's a real problem, even under the, under the present system. But I, one thing that we did um, at, at my school is we got the administration to say that if DACA was canceled or if um, these students lost their authorization to work, that the university would, and would, would increase their scholarships so they would have funds that are not working, you know, not wages, right? But they would somehow, we would be able to compensate for that. And I think that's something that maybe, you know, can be, um, I think anybody who's in a, um, uh, an institution of higher learning that has DACA students can think about how to do that, how to increase funding under non-waged categories that are like fellowships, internships, you know, these kinds of things that would be a way for people to work without technically working. Um, so I think that there's things that also nonprofits could do. Um, I don't think, you, I don't know if you could extend this to all workplaces, but I think there are a lot of things that organizations can do um, that could actually make a difference for people if they're suddenly faced with losing a work permit, for example. Can we hear some applause for our... <laughs> Thank you for coming.